Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at the White House. My apologies for uh, the fact that we're starting late. We are going to be having a live discussion today on health insurance reform, and we are very lucky to be joined by Senator Brown and Jared Bernstein, who is uh, Chief Economist and Economic Policy Advisor to the Vice President. For months, the administration has been listening to Americans from all over the country. We had regional forums back in March and April, and since then, we've been continuing the dialogue. So we're really excited to be doing that today, and especially because Senator Brown is a great voice for Ohioans, and we're going to be hearing some questions that he's been hearing from um, his uh, constituents, and we're also going to be taking questions through this live Facebook chat. So if you're watching, please uh, submit questions, and we are very excited to have you joining us. Uh, thank you, Jen. I'm really uh, excited to be here, and I want to be very brief so we can get right to this discussion about what, what, what I think is one of the most critical uh, areas that uh, uh, President Obama and our administration of Congress are working on right now, and that, of course, is health care reform. Now, as an economist, I'm constantly thinking about health care reform in very big macroeconomic terms, its impact on the economy, its impact on the, on the budget deficit, the fact that, that the path to, to really wrestling our, our, our fiscal challenges to the ground goes right through health care reform. But then I always want to stop and think about what health care reform really means to middle class families. And the other thing I do uh, here with the Vice President uh, is I'm the Executive Director of the White House Task Force on the Middle Class. And that task force, which by the way meant today, uh, consistently hears from middle class families about the struggles they, uh, they face with our health care system and, and the expenses that it has meant uh, for middle class families who have faced an increasingly insecure health care situation, a situation that I believe uh, uh, our health care reform plans uh, will uh, very, very much help to rectify. So uh, let me uh, turn things over to the senator and, and then to your questions. Uh, Jared, thanks. And Jen, thank you. I, Jared's exactly right. This is a, this is a, big, you know, a big political, a big economic question, but what it really is is what this means to middle class families, what it means to families that are struggling in, our, in my state from, you know, from Akron to Dayton and everywhere in between and from families for families all over the country. Uh, what I, I read, um, but it, it, you know, it, it matters individually to people. I, I go to the Senate floor day after day uh, reading some of the th literally thousands of letters and emails and phone calls we get. Uh, and what, two things really come through on these letters I get. One is that a huge number of Americans, at least from the mail I get, are people, who, um, people that are struggling who thought they had good insurance a year or two ago, but then something happened. They either had a child with a pre-existing condition or they themselves got very sick and the cost of their care was such that the insurance cut companies cut off their insurance uh, or they had some disability that the insurance companies engage in the practice of rescission, they call it, where they, where they eliminate your coverage and find some technicalities to do it. So people thought they had good insurance, found out they didn't far too many times as I read these letters. The second thing that often came through is I, the letters I get from people in their 50s and early 60s who, um, who don't have insurance for whatever reason, they lost their job or they had a pre-existing condition or they just had a job that didn't cover them. And they were just praying that they could get to be 65, get to that age so they, they'd have insurance. I get letters from 20-year-olds and 40-year-olds that talk about their parents are in that situation, that they, they look forward to being in Medicare, they're anxious, and they just need to get through those years until they do. That's, that's why I think the public option is so important, because it mimics Medicare and gives people, um, gives people that solid, predictable, stable coverage that they need. But we could talk certainly more about that. I know Jen wants to start with some questions from from people around the country. I have several questions that people have sent in um, from Ohio, and either I can start or you can start. Uh, why don't you start? Okay, look, I'll, let me start with a question I got that my husband, this is a woman from Galeen, Ohio, named Kelly. My husband worked for a small executive search firm that didn't provide benefits. We purchased private insurance at what was once a reasonable price. It tripled within a year. We still had a high copay. Despite the presence of an infant, we never met the deductible, and so we paid for our vaccinations and office visits out of pocket. Um, then she goes on to say, in February 2008, I was surprised to find out that we were expecting. Knowing that I required a C-section, I, I inquired about my new maternity coverage. I was shocked to learn that the pregnancy and birth, fifteen dollars to $20,000 it would cost, wouldn't be covered as they were considered a pre-existing condition. 
So this is a woman who had had a C-section, so she, the insurance company knew if she got pregnant, she'd have another C-section. So the insurance company considered the C-section a pre-existing condition. That's why women pay more for health insurance than men. How, why don't I ask Jared, how, how does health reform help Kelly? Uh, you know, if, if, if Kelly was the only story we've ever heard like that, we'd still want to do something about it. But in fact, her story is, is all too common. And the answer to your question, Senator, is that health care reform goes right at this target of ensuring, of, 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 of correcting those practices uh, in health insurance, really reforming health insurance in such a way that these kinds of problems uh, uh, don't uh, 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 plague folks like Kelly and families like hers moving forward. Um, uh, under health care reform, uh, pre-existing conditions cannot be uh, a criterion by which someone is rejected. Under health care reform, with this insurance reform component on top of it, um, uh, uh, the kinds of uh, artificial limits on coverage and benefits and the way coverage is rescinded or disappears right when you need it, that's disallowed. So I think one of the, you, know, you, you and I started talking about how this health care reform really affects people in their daily lives. I think this health insurance reform component of it goes right to the heart of that by disallowing a set of insurance practices that have made uh, uh, folks like uh, Kelly go through uh, something that just, you just don't recognize as compatible yeah, with, with even, life in America. And I would add, Jared, that even people today that, that are happy with their insurance, and, and many are, of course, uh, they will still get these consumer protections. They will, no more pre-existing condition uh, termination of care, no more discrimination based on disability or gender, as we've seen. That's no right. more caps on coverage so they lose their insurance. And, you know, the, the, you, you think about the, 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 the insurance companies, they, they hire all kinds of bureaucrats to decide we don't want to insure somebody because they got a pre-existing condition. Then they hire a whole bunch of bureaucrats to, at the end, when you submit a claim that deny your claim, and those days are going to mostly be over when we pass this insurance reform and have the public option to help enforce it. And I just want to reinforce one thing that, 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 that you just said, Senator. You said when we sign health insurance reform. In fact, the, 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 there are parts of the, these bills that will phase in over time. This isn't one of them. Health insurance reform starts uh, uh, right when, when these That's bills right. are signed. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Richard in Hawaii, and he says that prevention is key in Hawaii mm -hmm. for healthcare. So what can you tell him about prevention in health reform? Yeah, I'll take that one first. Sure. Uh, when we, when uh, the, our bill was written um, back in July, the first health care bill that passed the Senate Committee and the Health Education and Labor Pension Committee, Senator Dodd was then chairing it. Uh, Senator Harkin wrote some language that, had, that, that would really emphasize prevention and wellness, that, that our system is really predicated on sick care, not, not health care, if you will, not 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 really much emphasis on wellness and keeping people out of hospitals. In part, it's, um, it's taking care of chronic disease better than we do. So people in many countries with manageable chronic disease, things like diabetes and asthma, they spend a lot more time in the hospital in the United States than they do in other countries because they manage it when they're outside. One of the most expensive parts of the and system. That, that's exactly right. That's what drives costs up. That means more sick days for people. They're, not, they're in the hospital instead of managing their, they're managing their health, not their health care so much. While they're in, and this bill gives incentives for employers to pay a lot more attention to wellness and prevention. Yeah, I, I, all I would add to that is that part of insurance reform is making for making sure that insurance covers preventive care as well. It's a, it's a critically important cost saver. The share of our health uh, spending that we waste on uh, on on uh, uh, conditions that could be. Uh, prevented is, is, is huge and, as you suggested, much larger here than in, in other advanced economies. And even just once people are discharged from the hospital, Senator Mikulski and I worked on this language, she's from Maryland, to, been in the Senate for many years, to, um, to help people as they're discharged from the hospital, work with a nutritionist, work, work with, a, with a nurse uh, to keep people from having to go back into the hospital. You're taking your medicine or you're doing your doctor visits, your nutrition, all that. Let me read a letter from Avon Lake, Ohio, just actually five miles from my home west of Cleveland. Because I was disabled, comes from Anthony, by life-threatening heart disease, I'm required to take very expensive medications. What's Congress doing about the excess cost of prescription drug prices? Uh, I think one of the most important aspects of, of health care reform, and another thing that, that kicks in uh, very early uh, in, in this legislation, is closing what's called the Medicare donut hole. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a really kind of... A, 
uh, a strange policy that evolved in the, in the prior administration with the prescription drugs bill. The idea is that Medicare prescription drugs are covered up to a certain point, a few thousand bucks of your drug prescription drug coverage is, is paid for by Medicare. And then there's this hole where you're on your own for uh, a, a, another few thousand, and then coverage kicks back in uh, at, at, at a level above that. So all of a sudden, you've got prescription drugs paid for by Medicare, you're cruising along okay, and then you hit that hole, and, and it's up to you to take your wallet out and start paying thousands of dollars for your drugs. While you're still paying your premium. While you're still so, paying so your you premium. So you have to keep right. paying, right. So uh, th this bill closes that uh, a donut hole by uh, uh, making sure that prescription drugs for uh, seniors under Medicare are covered uh, as they need them. We're also doing some other things in this bill that there is, um, there's a new class of pharmaceuticals called biologics. They are still a relatively, relatively few compared to, to traditional uh, pharmaceuticals, traditional molecule pharmaceuticals. Uh, but biologics are very expensive. They can be, you know, sometimes they can be 50,000 or 100,000 a year. Uh, things like Herceptin and some other drugs that, that are very, very effective drugs. But we're trying to build in the legislation a pathway to generics so there can be competition and bring the price down. We also want to see um, uh, negotiated drug prices that Medicare can, can negotiate on behalf of their, their, their beneficiaries of the whole Medicare population the way that the VA does to bring prices down. Uh, and also, some of us are looking on the Senate floor to do a reimportation amendment, Senator Dorgan from North Dakota and I and some others, to, um, to allow people to buy drugs as they, some people in my state do. I used to take a bus from, of people from Cleveland to go to Windsor, Ontario, because the drugs, the same drugs, same packaging, same manufacturer, same dosage cost, half or a third as much because the Canadians have figured out better than we have how to keep these drugs at a, at a better price. So um, all of that's going to, we're going to work to put in the bill. As you say, some of that's already you know, in there. We've got a lot of work to do. Just one little point on that. It just reminds me of, again, uh, putting on the economist hat for, for a second. One of the ways in which we uh, uh, pay for health care, which, by the way, very important, deficit neutral. These plans don't uh, uh, add to the deficit. That's a, a, a prime principle of the president's. Uh, is by increasing competition. You, you mentioned uh, it in the case of pharmaceuticals, but it's, a, it's also important in terms of insurance. It's a great market principle. More competition means lower costs, whether you're talking prescription drugs or premiums. Right. Good. Um, well, so Siobhan from Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, wrote that she didn't realize that C -section, a C-section could be a pre-existing condition. So she was uh, very interested in that yeah. comment. Yeah, C-section also. I mean, a 22-year-old woman and a 22-year-old man often have, with the same history of, of um, generally, generally health, healthy, healthy. Um, Growing up, no, no real health problems. A man will often pay significantly lower insurance rates than a woman. Yeah. Uh, and it's complicated by the fact if a woman, in some insurance policies, if a woman's been a, in some insurance company practices, if a woman's been a victim of domestic violence, uh, she, she, that is considered a pre-existing condition because if she's been a victim once, she's more likely, yep. I guess, according yes, to statistics, yeah, to be a victim again. Well. Um, and it's, it's just outrageous. So it could, some, in some cases, rape victims have actually been considered a pre-existing condition. Um, and because they're more likely to have a, a disease that, that a woman that's not a rape victim. I mean, it's just, it's just outrageous that our insurance, when we have this for-profit insurance um, regimen in our healthcare system, lots of countries in the world, that they don't want to socialize medicine. They have insurance companies run their insurance, their, their, their health insurance system in many countries, but they're not for-profit. They're not-for-profit insurance systems, and that makes all the difference in the world because companies are going to deny care and deny claims so often because every time they do, they, they make more money. That's why the Aetna CEO can make $22 million a year while insurance profits have increased 400% in the last seven or eight years. So, Jen, let me just stress, because I want to be forward-looking here. Under the proposed uh, health insurance reform, this kind of discrimination that we're talking about for uh, pre-existing conditions would be prohibited. Insurance companies uh, won't be able to refuse coverage because of someone's medical history or health risk. And they'll be required to renew policies as long as the policyholder continues to pay their premium. They can't refuse to renew because you've become sick. It's, uh, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. That's the role of insurance, right? So uh, uh, part of insurance, uh, uh, the, the, the core uh, purpose of insurance for is to correct these problems. Uh, why don't we do another okay. question okay. from sure. Ohio? Uh, the, 
the current debate does not answer a critical question, will the country be better off with the proposed health reform legislation? This comes from Howard, Westerville, Ohio, a Columbus suburb, home of Otterbein College. The, the current debate doesn't answer a critical question, will the country be better off with the proposed legislation? Uh, that feels like a bit of a yeah. softball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the country will, will, be, will be better off. But you know, it's a great question in the sense of, if you, you can say that broadly, but, but how will the country be better off? I think, I think both of us began by talking about some larger economic trends and then brought it right down to families and we've been talking about uh, pre-existing conditions and the way insurers would be prohibited from engaging in some of the practices that we've, we've discussed that are so harmful to, to families. But let's talk about the country for a second. You know, you may have heard this, but let me just, just reiterate it. Uh, we, we spend uh, a, a, a half to uh, a two thirds, uh, I should say, let me put this way. every other advanced economy spends a half to two-thirds uh, of their GDP, of their economy, on health care compared to us. And they do so by providing universal coverage and typically with outcomes that are at least as good as ours, if not better. So one of the things that that ought to sort of clue us into right away is that we're wasting a lot. Uh, the, the, the two plus trillion dollars, the 70% of our, 17% of our economy we spend on healthcare every year, a lot of that is wasteful. If we can squeeze that waste out of the system, just think about how that, uh, the, those resources can be used, both to provide coverage, to pay for better healthcare reform, but to also uh, bring our fiscal uh, conditions into a sustainable range. As I said at the very beginning, we don't achieve uh, fiscal stability without healthcare reform. If we don't take the kinds of steps that we're so near <laughs> to completing, getting, if we don't get over that goal line, the status quo uh, will, will absolutely swamp uh, uh, the economy. What 17% of, of healthcare, of GDP now in healthcare becomes 30% if you go out a couple of decades. And then you're talking about just some very damaging crowding out. So uh, I think that's, that's really, you know, at least from the economist's perspective. I mean, it's and, and, I, and I would add that, you know, the, the engine of, of economic growth is, is really small businesses. Most of the hiring in this country is done by, you know, businesses of 10 or 50 or 100 or 300, but relatively small businesses. And I, I get letters all the time I, from people who run small businesses, uh, the owners, the owners and the, the, the heads of them that, that, that simply, that have covered their workers for years and, and it gets harder and harder to afford to cover. If, if you have 20 employees and one of them gets cancer, your insurance all of a sudden, because of one person out of 20, your insurance becomes unaffordable or yeah. the insurance company cancels you. I, a guy I got to know in Southwest Ohio in Cincinnati, same place as Siobhan was from, um, a small business owner told me for 26 years he's covered his, his, um, his employees and he's, it's, it was getting harder and harder, but he was still struggling and doing it. He wasn't able to put as much money back into the business as he wanted. And then just a month ago, he called me and said his insurance company canceled him by the end of the, the effect of the end of the year. Uh, that just happens too often. It's, it's it, a great, this, 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 it really does hurt economic growth. It's a great point. It's not just we're talking about burden on families. We've been emphasizing that's the burden on businesses. So our business would be more competitive. Uh, small and large alike. Small yep. and large yep. alike. Jen? Um, so we have a question from Alice, and she wants to know why there's so much debate when there are many countries which already have successful public health systems. Why do we not just follow one of these tried and tested <laughs> systems? Um, good question. Great. There, there are um, I, Americans. We want to do it our own way, and we've looked at countries around the world. Um, I think there are some bits and pieces of all kinds of systems that would work very, very well. But um, you know, we, we're doing, the, really in the end, we're, we're doing it our own way. Um, maybe we're a little bullheaded and don't want to learn from other countries enough, and I think you could probably argue that. But more than that, we're, we're doing it building around what we have now. We have a mm -hmm. Medicare system that's expensive, but that really has raised the standard of living given millions of Americans a longer, healthier life than they would have otherwise. And we have a Medicaid system that works pretty well. We have a VA system that works really well. Um, and and is, is, is so important for our veterans and a TRICARE system for retired veterans, retired soldiers and sailors yeah. and Marines and Coast Guard. And then we now, we also have the private, um, the private employer-based system. So we're trying to construct without major disruption among in people's lives and the economy trying to build this in a unique way. And that's, um, that's pretty hard to do. That's why all the debate, some say, let's just have Medicare for all and wipe the slate clean, do that. Um, that's not been the decision people have made. The president doesn't want to do it that way. We're, we're, so we're building it around what we have, preserving the best in the system, and trying to fix what doesn't work so well. 
I, I don't have a lot to add to that to that answer. If 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 you're if the the emailer is asking what the heck has taken us so long, uh, you know it's a fair question. Uh, but we are closer uh, than uh, uh, I think uh, any any Congress or administration has ever been to uh, a, a health care reform that embodies the principles we've been talking about so far. I will just re uh, underscore one point that the senator made. Um, one of the reasons it's taken, I think, this long is because um, the, even though the employer-based system uh, has some problems, there are many people who are actually pretty comfortable with their uh, employer-based plan. Now, over the last uh, a decade or so, we've seen a lot of cost shifting from employers onto workers. We've talked about the burden of excess health care costs on employers, and those are, those are principles we have to fix and, and, and that these bills do, do help to fix. But if the president has consistently stressed if you like what you have, you can keep it under health care reform. And, and I think that that's really an important point that the senator was making. Uh, we're not going to overlay a completely different new system imported from abroad. We're going to take our system, we're going to squeeze a lot of the fat out of it to help pay for the reforms that we've been discussing. And I would, I'm sorry, I would add one more point, but I think we probably need to wrap up pretty soon. But um, in, a, in a sort of an historical sense, as, as, as Jared said, that you know, we've been, what, what the, the question, if it suggests, why is it taking so long? Franklin Roosevelt tried to do this. Yeah. And in the same, well, we're hearing the same arguments against this that we, um, that we yeah. heard back with the I mean, creation of Medicare. There are vested interests. Yeah, there's a lot of the insurance companies, drug companies aren't wild about moving forward on this, and that's one of the things we're fighting. So we're, we're, we're going to deliver on it. And on that note, I just want to thank Thanks. you so much for joining us, and we really appreciate it. We hope you tune in uh, the next Facebook chat, and please visit um, www.healthreform.gov to get more information on health insurance reform. Thank you so much. Thank you all.